football might never again be played at Ashton Gate. Bristol City Football Club is on the brink of going out of existence. Well, that is the stark reality behind the club's financial crisis. The details revealed this week have shocked the supporters, the players, and the rest of the footballing world. It's an astonishing decline because less than six years ago, Bristol City was celebrating its greatest triumph, promotion to the first division. Time on a Saturday, I'm ready for anything. Spend an hour or two in a bloody girt queue to get in the ground and sing. One for the Bristol City, two for the boys in red, three for the fans down Ashton Gate. Follow till we're ten, me boys. Follow till we're ten. What happened then in footballing terms is simple. Bristol City spent four seasons in Division One, were relegated, spent one season in Division Two, were relegated again, and are now just three places from the bottom of Division Three. Whether they drop again down to Division Four may be purely academic, because the club is now broke. They simply have no more money to pay their bills. The news hit Bristol like a bombshell this week. And it hit the players first. Out of the blue, eight of the first team squad were asked to tear up their contracts in return for a cash settlement. Several had given their footballing careers to the club. Jeff Merrick, born in Bristol and a City player since the day he left school in the summer of 1966, team captain when City fought their way into Division One. Trevor Tainton, again born in Bristol and a City player for 17 years. Jimmy Mann, the club's top scorer this season, with 10 goals to his credit. Jerry Sweeney, with more than 400 league appearances. And Chris Garland, who left his hometown to play for Chelsea and Leicester before returning to Bristol City. Last Monday, the accountants arrived at Ashton Gate to put their last hope survival plan into operation. The first step was to tell the players they had to go. The players had no warning. I found out from Jimmy Mann on Sunday morning. And as you can see, I found out about five minutes before I arrived. Mm -hmm. I was washing a car. Really? Yeah. Certainly an unusual situation. For but the truth began to dawn on them. They were being asked to leave the club, their club, immediately. We love to say thousands of things. I mean, there are millions of things we've just been through this afternoon. Yeah, we're very, very upset, obviously. Not only for ourselves, but for Bristol City Football Club as well. We want to see the club saved, obviously. I mean, we don't want the club to go into... Uh, liquidation, and if we did stop playing, then obviously that would enhance the situation, that would make it even worse. So, we don't want to see that. But the next day, another chapter ended. Norwich City reserves arrived for a football combination game. But while some of the eight players under threat watched from the stand, the accountants declared that the club could no longer afford the luxury of a reserve team. The financial noose was being drawn tighter. The following day, Wednesday, came the most important negotiations so far between the players, the representatives of their trade union, the Professional Footballers Association, and the club's representatives, the chairman and the vice chairman. The talks went on for six hours non-stop in the accountant's offices on the top floor of a city centre block. The players waited. All they knew was that their livelihood was in the balance. Footballers are notoriously reluctant to discuss their earnings, but with the salaries of these players ranging between 12,000 and 20,000 a year, the amount offered to buy out all their remaining contracts, 58,000 pounds, was only a fraction of what they could have earned. Meanwhile, the talks were going badly. Archie, any words on the uh, meeting at all? Any news of the time? No, I, I honestly can't say they uh, are now meeting the players again, and they'll be meeting us uh, again after that, so I, I have no idea, to be honest. Several hours? Oh, I'd hope not, no. 
Are you feeling any more optimistic? For your sake. No, I really have no feelings at the moment. <laughs> I'm numb. Um... When, when we might have any news? Still in discussion, still locked in discussion. Yeah, I've seen nothing. The players claimed they were being blackmailed by being told that if they didn't accept the offer, Bristol City would be finished. But if they agreed to leave, they said, would they find other jobs? Four of them are over 30 years old. Others are injured or no longer in the first team. Then suddenly, after all the waiting, a stay of execution was announced. Negotiations are continuing and a decision is likely, uh, will definitely, in fact, be taken by noon next Wednesday, February the 3rd, 1982. Gentlemen, I'm afraid there are absolutely no comments which can be made with regard to that statement. You can't tell us what remains to be done, what the next step is? Uh, clearly, um, the agreement has to be reached with the players. That is the next step. And negotiations are continuing. Well, Have you seen the players? So the players had won a few days' grace, the result of a day-long battle by the representative Gordon Taylor. It's obviously a very delicate and uh, serious situation, both for Bristol City and for the players involved, and the game in general and uh, we're hoping we can reach a satisfactory uh, solution. Um, you know the possible consequences, and it's something we've been concerned about for some time at the PFA, the state of the financial finances of the game. And um, anyway, as we were told, decisions had to be made today, but after a lot of discussion, uh, we've got quite a few days' grace all the players, the eight players involved, have been made freely available for any club that wants them. And knowing the quality of the players concerned, I'm sure, or I'm hoping, that some of them will get fixed up and then we'll reassess the situation next Wednesday. I've just been advised by the PFA to say absolutely nothing. I'm afraid. Sorry you've been waiting so long. I'm sorry it's been a long day for you. It's been a long day for us. It's been absolute murder. Gordon is still in there. That's it. I'm terribly sorry about the day last year. It's all right. We're all together. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. So the players finally left, hardly knowing what to tell their families waiting anxiously at home. Jeff Merrick is the club's official representative on the Professional Footballers Association. The 16 years he spent on the books of Bristol City have certainly brought their financial reward. He insists his pay is nothing like the £500 a week that's been reported, but even if it's less than that, recent events probably mean the good times are over. This house we're in at the moment is a lovely house, but it belongs to the Bridgewater Building Society. I mean, there's no way that I've paid off hardly anything. So the only way we can live here is to carry on playing football. So once football's over, then everything has to be sorted up and we have to sort of move down more to our level, if you like. Um, but having said that, it, it's a problem that all footballers have to live with. Do you resent then, the situation you're in now? after 15 years at Bristol? I find it very uncomfortable. It's... It's not a nice feeling to read about yourself as possibly being on the move or possibly having your contract paid up or people saying that they'd like to get rid of the higher paid players, which in my opinion are the players that have done most for Bristol City Football Club um, that are still there. So, I do resent the situation, yes. The dire financial situation that's been causing so much concern for the players was revealed in stark detail at a news conference earlier this week. The club's chairman, Archie Gooch, announced that City's problems could only be solved by a far-reaching survival plan. As well as asking for the eight players to give up their contracts, it was proposed that a new company should be formed to run the club and funds raised by issuing a million pounds worth of new shares. Can I, at the outset, um, thank uh, my two colleagues here who are uh, of the company, I never get the name right, Arthur Young, McClellan and Moores, Moores and Company, um, who have unbelievably uh, put in so much work. I'm sure they've done a year's work in, uh, in, in about three weeks. And that emphasizes in many ways uh, 
the importance, the imperative, uh, or the important situation that the club found itself in, because action uh, has had to have been taken very quickly. Having said that, I will now open the meeting for any questions that might like to be put. Mr. Gooch, could you tell us first of all, in general terms, having seen the report now, the state of the finances of Bristol City? I think uh, Chris will answer the, those questions. Um, well, as can be seen from the handout which has already been given to you, the state of the finances of the city are very severe. And uh, there is no doubt that in, unless uh, immediate action is taken, then the club would be put into liquidation. What needs to be done in the next few days then to make sure that doesn't happen? Um, the directors have already made a decision um, to agree to our recommendations for a reconstitution of the club as set out in this statement here. The statement also set out the conditions for survival. These included the club getting the agreement of the players to being bought out of their contracts. The agreement of the creditors to a postponement of debt repayments at the moment the club owes huge sums to their bank, the inland revenue and various local firms. Also vital would be the success of the million pound share issue. And finally, the consent of the Football League to all of those measures. The accountant said if these conditions weren't met, the future of City would be bleak. If agreement is not forthcoming from these parties, uh, then I believe that the club will have to go into liquidation. Well, we're saying that the, um, the estimated shortfall of assets against liabilities, as, as far as creditors are concerned, is 850,000. Now, that means that the creditors' claims in total exceed the value of the assets of this company by £850,000. So Bristol City currently have debts of about £850,000. On top of that staggering figure, it's estimated that the club is losing £5,000 a week, and as the weeks slip by, the club sinks further and further into the red. The accountant's report says that City has lacked direction and control over the last five years, and Archie Gooch admitted that the directors should accept part of the blame. Well, I think, I think they do accept the, the criticism. The, uh, we have said that, uh, or the report says, that over the last five years um, that there has been a certain amount of mismanagement. And uh, I don't think uh, one can deny that. Uh, as a, as a new chair, chairman of year standing, uh, one of the things that I've always felt um, was there was no mileage in recrimination. Uh, the only uh, thing which we want to see is the survival of the Bristol City Football Club. The club's crisis has been the talking point around Bristol all week. In the city pub, Wedlocks, just a hundred yards from the scene of the financial battle, it's the main topic of conversation. Inside, supporters were quick to pick out who they thought had made the mistakes at Ashton Gate. Not the players, the management. Very bad management over the years. From Ari Dorman, before him, everyone that had been on the committee, chairman the lot, none of them had never been any good to the club. The last manager we had was the worst ever. That's my opinion. If they go under, it's going to be a sad thing for Bristol, and I think it probably could have been stopped, you know. If you take today, for instance, John Tossacks, who's sixth in the first division, has gone out and bought Ray Kennedy for £160,000. He hasn't waited to get worse. He's paying out now. I don't know if the money was available then, but I think that was the time to consolidate when they got into the first division. And they should have floated, a, I think, anyway, a share issue then, when people would have been interested to put money in. Now I think it's a bit late, and it's very, very sad. To make the players the scapegoat, the backbone of the club, is absolutely disgusting. I mean, you're talking about the likes of Jeff Mirror, 15 years service at the club, the club captain that took them to the first division, gave us three good years in the first division. They've admitted five years, at least, of mismanagement. It's mismanagement since we got into the first division. And, you know, you're talking about 74, 75. And we had three years there. And it's, it's gone overnight. And then at the end of the day, we don't start from the top and work down. We start from the players and work up. 
and we put players under two days pressure to get out and make Bristol people believe that they're the problem. They're not the problem. The Bristol Evening Post has been charting the ups and downs of City for many years. The present sports editor agrees with the accountant's criticism of the club's management. Recalling the many articles he'd written during the memorable years in Division I back in the late 70s, when even a place in Europe was thought within reach, Peter Godsiff says City's slide has been completely unnecessary. I feel very sad. In fact, I'm horrified by the news this week that the club is almost on the point of extinction. Uh, and I'm very angry as well because I don't think the club should have been allowed to go into such decline as it is at the moment. Why angry? Well, I feel that the people who've been running the club have let Bristol people down. They've let the public down, the supporters down, by allowing the club to get into this terrible situation. What do you think the main problem has been then over the last few years? Well, I think basically it's been mismanagement. I feel that the, the directors haven't uh, had, the, had their finger on the pulse of the club. I think it started the first year after they went into the first division when uh, Robert Hobbs was the chairman and uh, he wanted to get rich directors to come in and join him, each put in £25,000 to become members of the board. The rest of the board closed ranks against him and he ultimately was ousted. Uh, there were long high court battles, very ugly battles, and I think that was the start of the club's decline. How about the management tactics over the last week, say? How do you see them? Well, I, I'm quite mystified, actually, that, that the club has got into this kind of situation. Uh, I knew things were very, very bad. Uh, it's been made very clear by the chairman, Archie Gooch, over a number of months, but I had no idea it was quite as bad as it is today. Things certainly didn't look that bad five years ago. Bristol City were playing the best teams in the country each week in Division One, and manager Alan Dix had got them there with a team which had few, if any, star players. It was only later that several former internationals nearing the end of their careers were brought in. Players like Norman Hunter, Terry Cooper and Joe Royal. Royal! Oh, look at that! City. But behind the smiles, there was tension too, especially in that first season in Division One. In the end, it all depended on the last match. City had managed only 12 league wins, which wasn't enough to ensure First Division safety. Their final game was at Coventry, and afterwards, Coventry's most famous managing director arrived in the dressing room to congratulate City on the two-all draw, which had saved both teams from relegation. It couldn't have happened to two nicer teams. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, Cheers. Well done. Well done, Bristol City. Well done, lads. But then came a turning point for City. The decision by Gary Collier to exercise his freedom of contract by walking out and negotiating his own transfer. It sent shivers through the City boardroom as they wondered who'd be next to go. Alan Dix acted immediately to keep the players he needed at Ashton Gate. He offered a seven-year contract to Jerry Gow, the man he always wanted at the heart of the midfield. Tom Ritchie was signed up for seven years too, with an incredible 11-year contract for Clive Whitehead. Alan Dix, his critics said, had saddled the club for years to come with a crippling wage bill. Well, you can only react to the situation you're in. If I was, as people say to me now, with hindsight, would I give the contracts out that I gave in the first division? Well, no one can say that. If I was dealing with third division players, I would be paying third division players their money, which is third division standards. We were dealing with the first division, a club that would probably always be in the bottom half of that division because we're competing against the big, uh, the, the big boys in the first division who could afford to pay a million pounds. I didn't spend a million pounds in 13 years. So you're in a situation where you're always very much about what the housekeeping's all about. And uh, the system that we brought in eventually, with my recommendations, I recommended to the board of directors, they were quite aware of what was going on, which is proved with minutes I have to hand, and the decision was made. And we looked at it to make sure that we were trying to protect Bristol City's future, but in the first division. Remember that. First division, not third division. <laughs> But when the third division did become reality and the players gathered last August for their pre-season photo call, many of them were still earning first division wages. Crowds, though, had already fallen from over 20,000 to as low as 6,000. New manager Bob Houghton soon found out how bad things were. The unfortunate fact is um, that when you learn it, losing the sort of money we were, which was about 9,000 pounds a week, that when you sell players, it factors 
is very short term and just gets you on a spiral that's very difficult to get off of. Your gates drop, so you have to sell players to survive. And the sale of players drops your gates even further. So it's a spiral that really needs to be broken. But attendances this season have slumped even more, lower at times than they've ever been since the war. Supporters have stayed away from a club that's losing. And without support, the club has gone on losing. Bob Houghton resigned, seeing no other way out, and the directors saw the bottom of the slippery slope coming closer. And we've got to sort of find some ways and means if I know that sort of uh, results will be one thing and that we hope mm. to come our way, Lady Luck will come along with us uh, one of these days to, to give us better resource. But obviously the generating of, of people into the ground is a real sort of must. Bristol City isn't the only club playing before near empty terraces. It's simply the most dramatic example yet of what's gone wrong with our national game. In our London studio now is Jimmy Hill, presenter, of course, of Match of the Day, but also very closely concerned in his career with both players and management. Jimmy, first of all, are you surprised by this week's events in Bristol? No, I'm not surprised, and I don't think anybody in football could really be, because we all know how difficult it is to keep a club alive uh, in this day and age. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in the... Well, towards the end of this year, and certainly in future years, if more clubs follow Bristol City's uh, sad... Plight. So how many other clubs are, are in a similar state, do you think? Well, I suppose you could say that with the crowds that we see coming in at the moment, uh, the nation could probably house 12 uh, professional football clubs, um, the, the giant big city clubs. But some of those clubs, because they've been too ambitious uh, over past years, are perhaps in worse trouble with their bankers than, than smaller clubs which have been better run. So. Um, I don't think you can say that any club can uh, call itself permanently solvent for the next five or ten years. Clearly, in Bristol City's case, the most crippling financial burden is their wage bill. Are players being too greedy, do you think? I don't think players are too greedy because I think players are always entitled to negotiate the best possible contract that they can get. Uh, and neither do I think it was such a stupid decision on Bristol City's part to give certain players 10-year contracts for the reasons that they did that time, uh, that time ago. But it looked the right thing to do at the time. Unfortunately, two things have happened to make it a wrong decision. One, that uh, the trend in the game is for far less people to come through the turnstiles. And two, uh, however nice a person that one offers a 10-year contract to, I'm afraid that at the end of the day, they um, put their heads on the cushion and don't necessarily uh, run for their life for the club. Now, that's not being particularly unkind to those Bristol players, but I think that's a general trend. It doesn't happen that way, and I only wish it did. You talked about falling attendances. I mean, is there a danger that there's actually too much football as far as the public's concerned, e even with respect on television? I don't think there's too much football. I think there is too much football that people no longer enjoy. We now see a game locked in the middle of the field and managers and coaches talk about work rate and character and pressurising the other team. And quite often the goalkeepers on both sides, that you, all they have to do is to pick the ball up and kick it for a goal kick once in a while, certainly in the early stages of a game. In, in essence, the game is more boring than it used to be. Uh, we didn't uh, apply work rate to Stanley Matthews and Tom Finney or Dennis Law or Bobby Charlton. We went to see them because they could do special things, not continually pop the ball five yards backwards and forwards and uh, more often back, more backwards than forwards. And I think the public find that boring. And simply, we have to make the product on the field exciting again for them. Because it isn't that there's too much, it's that they don't enjoy it as much as they used to when they go to a ground. Can you, Jimmy, see a club like Bristol City with the problems they've now got surviving? Bristol City will survive in the same way that Oxford United survived, uh, either by one person or group of persons uh, who really love the game coming forward and, and, and putting a you know, financial uh, uh, platform down, a temporary one, which would enable them to get over this particular hurdle. Now, if they could get a clean sheet, they've got as much chance of surviving as any other of the 92 clubs in the Football League. If, if the game is run properly in the future, if we are more careful with the money, and more than anything else, if we make it bright and breezy and entertaining on the field, then the game will get back to where it used to be. Yeah,
But getting back to the old days could be even more difficult for City now. Not only will they lose the eight players now under threat, they've also this week put another three top players up for sale, Mick Harford, Terry Boyle and Jan Muller. If they all go, that would reduce the playing staff to just 13. Earlier today, though, it was the turn of City's seven directors to step into the limelight, meeting at Ashton Gate for the last time together to choose a caretaker board for the new football company and consider ways of raising the money City need. But it won't be easy in Peter Godsiff's view. The million pound share issue, which is being proposed now as the salvation of the club, uh, could be successful if the club attract big, big money from three or four people. I think it needs big money to get a million pounds or somewhere near. You're not going to get that in hundred pounds or five pounds or even a thousand pound donations from several people. It's going to be big money. So do you think raising a million pounds on a share issue is a realistic hope? I don't think so, not the way they've treated the players. And at the end of the day, uh, when you've got a board of directors that admit that they've gone wrong over a long period of time and then expect to start from the bottom in work up, how the hell do you expect local business people to put it in? Today's meeting lasted just over an hour. The two biggest hurdles to overcome in the next four days are without doubt the agreement of the creditors to a delay and agreement with the PFA over the players' contracts. You talked on Tuesday about the glimmer of light. Is the light growing any stronger? Well, it all depends, uh, really, on the on the next week. Uh, uh, I am I am relieved because uh, there is a chance that uh, there will be a, a, a Bristol City Football Club in existence. What has got to happen in the next four days to save the club? Well, the crucial meeting with the creditors and with the uh, with the PFA, uh, that, that really uh, is the crucial point. You've got to get the creditors to delay, to agree to a delay. Well, uh, Mr. Barlow will be meeting the creditors and discussing with them, no doubt, in the near future. When will that meeting take place? I have no idea yet. You say you're very tired, Archie. Does that mean you've had enough? You really don't want to carry on if there is a new board? No, 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 no. I want to see this through. And uh, it is entirely up to the shareholders. If uh, I'm very willing to carry on because I really would like to have a period of time in this football club where it's not panic. <laughs> and do you, do you think you can? Yes, if the plans that are being uh, uh, discussed now um, do come off, and it means a great deal of support from the public, um, then this club can be a great club. And one thing is certain that it's only a fool that doesn't learn from mistakes that have been made in the past and this will be a very efficient run company that is subject to the shareholders putting onto the board the caliber of man that is required uh, to 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 do that but oh. um it, it has been a long grind <laughs> but no i i want to see it through and i'm sure my vice chairman who has supported me unbelievably uh, throughout this year uh, feels very much the same as I do. Are your team's playing tomorrow. Is anything you'd like to say to them? No, they're professional men, and I have no doubt at all that uh, that our players will go out and do their best, and let's hope we can get three points tomorrow, which will give us another little bit in that uh, light, light at the end of that tunnel. Are you going to watch it? Yes, I should be there. And that was the last statement Archie Gooch was to make as chairman of Bristol City. This afternoon, the club announced the names of the new caretaker board. Leslie Q, already on the board, will be joined by his fellow director Ivor Williams and the two businessmen behind the £1 million share issue. Meanwhile, another list went up on the players' notice board, the squad travelling to play Newport tomorrow. By midday next Wednesday, we shall know whether these were the last footballers ever to play for Bristol City.